Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend Chris Shade. I first met Chris in a sushi bar. Uh, we were, uh, I was eating with my family and a DO friend of mine weighs me over from the bar and he says, I got somebody you need to meet. And uh, as we, uh, they were drinking sake so I joined them and as we were tossing back the little sake cups and getting more and more under the influence, I thought, boy, this guy is really onto something. So, um, nobody gave me your biographical data. You have a PhD from University of, Illinois. University of Illinois in inorganic chemistry, a specialist in mercury analysis. His PhD was in, uh, his thesis was in, in uh, uh, analysis of mercury in complex samples. He spent a long time uh, analyzing environmental samples until he got hooked up with Ann Summers. And uh, when Ann Summers talks about 200 and some odd samples of monkey poop with mercury in it. He is the man who went through the 200 and some odd samples and mashed them up and measured the mercury. So with great pleasure, Chris Shade. I do have a financial interest of a product in my talk uh, or a company offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. Now that being said, uh, I am the boss at my company and thus I didn't have to grind up the monkey poo. <laughs> my technician did it. And he was famous for saying, I'm not afraid of poo. And so he got the job. So uh, I'm very grateful to be here. I was grateful to find Steve that night. And uh, it, was, it was kind of a funny story because the osteopath I was with uh, said, you got to meet this guy, Steve Coral. And he goes like this. He goes, oh, my God, he's outside on the street. And I was like, well, I'm going to go get him. And so I dragged him in and plied him with sake. And he let me talk here uh, well, or something like that. Uh, as he said, I started off in environmental work. Uh, my PhD was in the environmental chemistry of mercury, uh, which is highly complex and involves a, a number of transformations between different forms, between different compartments, and it's a it's a very uh, it's a very complicated chemistry. And some of the best chemists in the world for metals chemistry are in environmental chemistry, and they taught me a lot about uh, what are called metal ligand interactions. Uh, metals don't move around naked in a, in a solution. You don't put mercury in water and you have free mercuric ion. It's always bound to something by these semi-covalent bonds. And how it moves from place to place and the transformations that it goes through are dependent on what is bound to it. And it was with that knowledge that I developed analytical systems and it was with that knowledge that I look at the natural detoxification system for mercury and how your body is supposed to be processing it and getting it out and what gets in the way of that and so that's really what I'm going to talk about uh, I was also a little confused when they told me I was going to come here and talk I thought I was the only speaker here for two days and uh, and so I wrote down that I was basically going to teach you everything you ever wanted to know about mercury but we're afraid to ask and so I have this three and a half hour long talk here that I'm going to give to you in an hour so I just fueled up on espresso and uh, we're going to start rolling uh, so, uh, the talk is called Looking Inside the Black Box, Understanding Analytical Approaches, Diagnostic Tools, and Detoxification Strategies for Mercury Intoxication. Uh, warning, heretical content in here. We're going to talk about things that people have not talked about in a long time, like how you analyze things. We're going to talk about using blood for analysis. A lot of you have probably been told blood is like a two to three day marker, uh, and it's just not. We're going to talk about analyzing without provocation, without using any chelators, uh, and because we don't really need any of that stuff as long as we have advanced analytical techniques. So, what I hope to get through here is what the key forms of mercury are going into the body, how the natural detoxification system works, and if there's anything I want you to take home from this, this is the most important part of the whole game. Uh, well, that and this, how the detox system gets subverted, leading, leading to biochemical stress. 
Then we're going to talk a little bit about mercury analysis. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a product system for uh, draining mercury out of the body using primarily the body's own natural systems. So the forms of mercury. Uh, elemental mercury is uh, the lead player in the dental world. Uh, that's the metallic form that you're amalgamating, and it has both a liquid and gas form. Uh, so you, you're looking at the liquid. Uh, it's the only metal that's in a liquid state at room temperature. And just as if you were looking at water, you know there's a vapor form of water above the pool of liquid. Same for mercury. You have a gas form, and that's what's being inhaled. Inorganic mercury is then the oxidation product of elemental mercury uh, turn, losing to electrons and going to Hg2+. This is inorganic mercury, the salt. Oops. Methyl mercury is an organomercurial formed by bacterial synthesis from inorganic mercury. Fortunately, Ann Summers started talking about methylation of mercury in the gut and in the environment, so I won't have to spend too much time talking about how you get there. But it is bacteria doing this, and it has very different properties from inorganic mercury in terms of its mobility and its toxicity, and uh, in terms of how, how it moves through the body and is excreted. Uh, ethyl mercury, just to mention it, is similar to methyl mercury. It's coming as a synthetic organomercurial, as a preservative in vaccines. Uh, you get very high uptake of it because it goes right into you, and it breaks down very quickly into the inorganic mercury. Transporter mercury. Elemental mercury, 80% uptake through the lungs. This is the chief problem, is that it's evaporating out of the amalgams, 80% uptake through your lungs. It's also all through the old dental offices, and all day long, you're taking this in. It comes in as a little neutral monatom. What that means is that it can diffuse across basically every membrane you have. It can go across the blood-brain barrier, it can go into tissues, it can go into joints. Uh, you don't take it up much from your intestines, but through the lungs is how you're getting it. And then it oxidizes, uh, after not very long, to the inorganic form. Now, the inorganic form is a very disruptive form, but you don't normally uptake it from the intestines. So you're corroding amalgam in your mouth, you're swallowing it, you have a lot of inorganic mercury moving through your intestines, but you're only absorbing a few percent of that. The real problem of that is inflammation states in the gut. But here you have elemental mercury coming in as a vapor, oxidizing to the inorganic mercury once it gets somewhere. And again, inorganic mercury, low uptake through the intestines, poor mobility in the body, and doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It needs to get there either via elemental mercury or as methyl mercury. Now, methyl mercury has very good uptake through the intestines. In fact, you have about 95% uptake through the intestines. When you eat fish, you break down fish into methyl mercury cysteine. The cysteine residues are what's binding the methyl mercury. Uh, methyl mercury cysteine is a molecular mimic for methionine and thus goes across amino acid transplant quarters in the intestines, at the blood-brain barrier, and at the placental barrier. So this has the keys to the kingdom. It can get anywhere. It can get into cells, uh, and it can do its job, either its toxicity alone or breaking down into inorganic mercury. Ethyl mercury, of course, it's an injection. It's 100% absorbable, very good mobility across the blood-brain barrier. The problem with ethyl mercury, it breaks down into inorganic mercury very rapidly, uh, and thus it has a lot of potential for toxicity. Targets of mercury forms, you've probably heard this in a number of different talks along the years. Just to highlight them, the brain central nervous system. Again, elemental mercury right into the brain. Methyl mercury right into the brain. The kidney is taking a whopping load of the mercury that's moving out of the body. And if you looked at James, James Wood's article on the kids, you see that the, the kidneys really stop being able to process it over time. I'll show you uh, some analyses of older dentists where their kidneys are slowing down their ability to get it out because they get hit so hard. Uh, the liver, the liver is the other route out. It's either going kidney or liver. Most of it is going through liver to fecal absorption, uh, and it's a very strong liver toxin. The heart is, uh, is a very strange and uh, not very well understood part of this game. Uh, Paranandi is going to talk about vascular stress and, uh, and stress to the heart from oxidative damage from mercury. Uh, and I believe Boyd Haley has talked about uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy uh, and, uh, and high amounts of mercury found in that. 
Uh, pituitary thyroid, you're going to find this all the time, thyroid dysregulation, uh, pituitary, uh, thyroid, and, uh, and the adrenals being dysregulated. Uh, this, you see this in, in mercury problems all the time. And in fact, mercury gets away for thyroid. Mercury gets in the way of conversion of T4 to T3, and, and you have a lot of uh, dysregulation from that. Heart of toxicity. There's two reasons that mercury is so toxic. One is inappropriate binding, and uh, Ann Summers touched on this. Paranandi is going to touch on this. This is where mercury is binding to predominantly sulfhydro groups that are supposed to be doing some other thing. They're either holding enzymes, uh, they're either parts of enzymes holding a zinc in place, but the mercury has millions to billions of, of times more affinity for the sulfhydrals than the zinc does. And so it gets in the way and dysregulates the enzyme. Uh, it dysregulates redox proteins. It consumes uh, thyroidoxin, which is a redox protein, and glutathione. Uh, and Paranandi will talk very nicely about what it does when it binds to membranes inappropriately. Oxidative damage and related inflammation. Uh, mercuric mercury is a very strong catalyst of lipid peroxidation. And so you're damaging membranes, uh, you're causing runaway oxidation, and uh, ultimately, if you have enough oxidation in the mitochondria, this leads to cell death. Uh, we'll just run through this quick. Basically, if this is a generic thiol and that's a cysteine, this proton here is getting replaced with a mercuric or a methylmercuric uh, cation, it's leaving a free proton, uh, acidifying the milieu there, and, uh, and then binding uh, where it shouldn't to this thiol. Again, we can kick out metals like zinc, nickel, copper, iron from places where they used to be. Uh, oxidation of these thiols is a very important one. I'm not going to talk a lot about thyroidoxin, but in future talks we probably will. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about glutathione. So now, how the natural detoxification system works. The defense system is a glutathione-based system. Uh, glutathione is an antioxidant. It is your prime antioxidant. It is what is controlling the redox environment in your body. It's up around 5 to 10 millimolar in the cells, which uh, is actually it's quite, a large, it's quite a large amount, and it's, it's maintaining the redox values. It's also your primary detoxification molecule. And it's, very, it's involved in protein repair. So when you have oxidation and you're, you're oxidizing uh, thiol groups on proteins, the glutathione system is responsible for repairing that. Uh, glutathione is a thiolic tripeptide composed of glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. Uh, it's got a unique linkage that keeps it anionic. And uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit. The glutathione system is a vast system. And we just talk about often just about, oh, how much glutathione do we have? But there's all these enzymes that depend on glutathione to exercise their activity. Or the glutathione level is dependent on these enzymes or genes for creating the glutathione. So you have synthetases, which are creating glutathione from the precursors. You have transpeptidases, which take apart and reassemble glutathione in different areas. You have transferases. This is very, very important. We're going to talk a lot about this. A transferase, uh, if I was a transferase and I had uh, methylmercury here and glutathione there, I would bring them in enough proximity that they can link up very tightly. Or if it's an organic molecule, the transferase is responsible for bringing these together so that they can link up. Uh, and that's called phase two conjugation. Deficiency in the phase two conjugation is associated with a number of degenerative diseases because you fail then to properly detoxify your body. Uh, peroxidases are using glutathione's reducing uh, capacity to quench free radicals like lipid peroxides. Reductases take oxidized glutathione and cycle it back to reduce glutathione, which is the active molecule. Redoxins are using glutathione uh, for protein repair, and glutathionylation is a very, very interesting and important thing that's just getting its due now. And this is glutathione going to free cysteine or sulfhydro groups on proteins and binding to it to protect it from some sort of oxidative attack. If there's an oxidative cascade, you go and you bind up these proteins that are very important, or you bind up these cysteine residues that are very important to the proteins uh, action, 
and thereby protect them from the free radicals that are coming at them. And then you have enzymes for pulling the glutathione back off when the activity has gone away. And they're finding out now that these are very important in signaling your overall biochemistry. Uh, the human detoxification system is arranged into three phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one and two have been worked out for decades and they're talked about a lot. Phase three is probably the most important because it has a lot of control over the ones before it and it was only worked out in the last decade or so. Phase one is an activation of a molecule. It doesn't come into play in metals, but if it's a benzene or a polyaromatic hydrocarbon, it needs this oct activation activity before it can proceed into phase two conjugation. Phase two conjugation, phase three, transport out. We've just made a conjugate out of the polyaromatic hydrocarbon, one that we can recognize and send out the door. So the activity of these transporters, these are active transporters using energy to do this. If these don't work, you're out of luck. Phase one, as I said, oxidative activation. This is usually associated with the cytochrome P450 system. It's not always oxidative, but all, most of the time it is. And uh, again, it's preparing for conjugation in phase two to glutathione, glucuronic acid, sulfate, glycine, or other amino acids. It's not needed for metals, but very important for coupling to phase two. The real issue with phase one is that it's essentially creating a free radical out of your polyaromatic hydrocarbon. So now, not only do you have a toxin, but you have a toxin free radical. And you're doing that to make it more reactive. But if phase two is not there, you're going to run into a lot of oxidative damage on, on your own. And there's, uh, there's testing now for looking at the coupling of phase one to phase two. Phase two this conjugation to make the toxin more water soluble and recognized by the transporters, the doors that are going to shove it out. Glutathione S transferases are the ones that we're most uh, concerned with here because they work with glutathione. There's, uh, they find low expression of the glutathione S transferases, either environmentally caused or genetically caused. They find low expression in people who have high methylmercury levels or who are sensitive to ethylmercury. The transferases are essential for getting these organomaterials out of your body. Phase three, transport out. Several different transport proteins. They're all in the same family. They have slightly different uh, names like the canalicular multi-organic anion transporter. Again, organic anion is the key thing here. The multi-drug resistance proteins. Uh, it was the drug companies who figured out how these things work because they wanted to know why their drugs weren't working on some people like chemotherapeutics and they figured out it's because these people were good detoxifiers so then they make drugs to turn off your detoxification system it was very nice of them uh, so again these are organic anion transporters the key here is it's the same transporter for a whole bunch of different pathways so glutathione isn't your only detoxification uh, chemical. Glucuronic acid is very important. Uh, and so different, different chemicals, different toxins are, being, are going through different conjugates, but they're all going out the same doors, the same transporters. So if the transporter doesn't work, it doesn't mean that you just hold on to mercury. It means you hold on to mercury and polyaromatic hydrocarbons and PCBs and a number of uh, other things. So it is a big issue to have the transporters working. The transporters are present in the cells, they're present in the liver, intestines, kidneys. Of course, the excretory organs have the most. So the liver and then the intestines have the most of these. Again, I said they're organic anion transporters. This is glutathione, and incidentally, that's glutathione down there. And uh, glutathione, you put it into water, and it has two protons released off of it, and it has this nice uh, negative, negatively char negative charge. And so then when you have mercuric, mercuric has two arms for binding, whereas methylmercury has one. Mercuric will take two glutathiones on it. It'll have a net negative two charge. It's easy to transport. Methylmercury has one of its arms bound by the methyl group. The other arm is holding onto a glutathione. It has a net negative one. All right, next step in our very fast movement here, how the detox system gets impaired, leading to biochemical stress. Okay, so 
All right, maybe you don't have enough glutathione. You have a glutathione deficiency, and that could be genetic. You can have uh, glutamate cysteine synthetase polymorphisms, and you just can't make enough of it. Or you can have some sort of epigenetic dysfunction or methylation dysfunction where you have the genes, but you can't even transcribe them. Or you can have environmental exposures that cause oxidative consumption or environmentally caused uh, inflammation, which is going to turn down your own synthesis of glutathione. Glutathione S transferases, same deal. It could be genetic, or it could be epigenetic, or it can be environmental. What are the problems that come when you're, I mean, we've talked in, in this forum, people talk about genes for APOE, they talk about CPOX genes. Uh, glutathione S transferase genes are very important, and they found that uh, the lack of your glutathione S transferase genes is associated with hemolytic anemia. Uh, sensitivity in children, cognitive impairment from DDT. And this was a mixture of the, of the glutathione synthesis genes and the transferase genes. Bladder cancer, this is called an odds ratio. If you have a problem in your GSTM1, you're 1.6 times more likely to have bladder cancer. If it's GST2, you're 1.7. If you have both of those uh, malarranged, you have an odds ratio of 2.82 but that I didn't put in there. Or one of these plus environmental exposure, you're almost three times more likely to get bladder cancer. What you're seeing here is you're missing the gene and then you're exposing yourself, you're in trouble. That's why some people are very debilitated by mercury and some people are not so debilitated. Uh, leukemia is also listed there too. Uh, Breakdown of the defenses, we talked about glutathione, we talked about glutathione as transferase. How does phase three break down? Phase three can get blocked, and then phase two gets dragged down with it. So you're stopping multiple detoxification pathways by tagging your phase three. How does phase three get turned down most easily? Inflammation, especially gut inflammation. And gut inflammation, you know, John Wilson uh, works on a lot of autistic patients. This is a hallmark of autism, inflammation and free radical damage. Uh, this can easily be caused by heavy metal-induced oxidative damage in the gut, like by you swallowing amalgam 24-7. This is just, uh, uh, you know, just to prove that I have a PhD, I put stuff up here that you can't really understand. Uh, and, and so these, uh, these were rats, and uh, this is, what they did is in, induce inflammation in the body and see how well the transport proteins worked. And so the controls here, this is IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So they put uh, lipopolysaccharides, from, uh, which are membrane proteins from, uh, from bacteria, induced inflammation. You see in the, in the LPS group, the pro-inflammatory cytokines go way up. And where do they really go way up? They're really going way up in the active parts of the small intestine. And that's where all these transporters are most highly located. And then, okay, this is gene transcription then to make the transporters. And that's the control, and that's the inflama induced inflammation. Your gene transcription goes way down for the transporters. These are all different types of transporters. And uh, then this is the transport of chemicals across those transmembrane proteins. So there's the control, here's the induced inflammation. You're going down by 50 to 75 percent by inducing inflammation. And this is a chemical known to stop the transporters. It's not even as potent as inflammation. Just to show you uh, a little visual of the, of the coordinate expression of the phase two, the transferases, and the phase three, the transmembrane proteins for moving things out. Uh, in red are stained the, the uh, glutathione as transferase, phase two. In green is MRP2, the phase three. You put them over one another and you get this yellow. They're made in the same places. The same set of genes turn them on together. So if you turn down phase three, you turn down phase two, too. So what does this look like schematically, then? Uh, you have, this is a flow of uh, a toxin from the cell out of the body. And you have phase one, you have oxidative activation. It moves on into phase two for conjugation with glutathione, sulfate, or glucuronic acid. And then those conjugates are moved to a cellular protein that throws them into the blood. There's one at the liver that pulls them out of the blood into the liver, then out of the liver in through this transporter into the normal small intestine. And everything's flowing out nicely and you're staying alive. 
Uh, then we move into inflammation in the small intestine. And what that does then is turn down the activity of the transporter, which turns down the activity of the remote for some reason. Uh, and then that feeds back and turns down the activity of the phase two enzymes. Now you're not shuttling things out so well anymore, but nobody tells phase one to stop. So phase one is moving forward with this oxidative action, making free radicals for your body to use, well, for the attack on your body, but nobody's getting rid of them. So this is the picture that happens when you go into the inflammatory states in the gut. All right, now, uh, this is just a quick picture of some analysis we did taking cysteine and rinsing people's mouths, whether they had uh, amalgams or no amalgams. We'll just go back for a second. So this is somebody with no amalgams. You can see methylmercury actually coming from the blood through the epithelia in the mouth, meaning that the mercury in the mouth is also going back into the blood. So methylmercury is his first peak. The inorganic mercury is the second peak. This is another person. Methyl and organic. Inorganic is pretty small. Then we go to someone with amalgams, and there's their methyl peak, and then their inorganic mercury peak flooded my machine, shut me down for about two or three hours till that signal went away. The amount of inorganic mercury coming out of her mouth just rinsing it with cysteine was 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than the person without amalgams. So that means your whole intestinal tract is coated with this stuff, and that is easily can cause the inflammation that we're looking at. How does this work at a cellular level? Uh, if you bombard the cell with, with mercury, you start stress in the mitochondria. The mitochondria get to a certain point of oxidative stress where they start leaking uh, reactive oxygen species, which leads to a decay in glutathione as glutathione is used for covering up the exposed thiols, trying to put out the fire by mopping up the, reduced the reactive oxygen species and binding up the mercury. When you can't deal with it anymore, then you start oxidizing thioredoxin because the glutathione is protecting the thioredoxin. Once you oxidize the thioredoxin, you release the signal for your own death and you have apoptosis or cell death. So. Before I tell you the good news uh, about getting rid of toxicity, we'll move on to talking about analytical stuff. Testing for mercury. Uh, there's ambient measures and provoked measures. The word on the street for many years has been going with provoked measures, not ambient measures. But what are the measures? Ambient measures, there's blood, hair, urine, and stool. Provoked measures, it's pretty much just urine. Provoked meaning you're taking DMSA, you're taking DMPS, they're causing mercury to go down through your kidneys, and then you're reading how much mercury comes out in your urine versus a pre-chelation urine. Now, what are the forms of mercury in all of these different compartments? So in the ambient compartment, blood is, has both methylmercury and inorganic mercury in it, and methylmercury in somebody who has both fish exposure and amalgam exposure, methylmercury will be at least 10 times higher than the inorganic mercury. And this is probably the key to why people didn't like blood when they're looking for amalgam toxicity. Hair is methylmercury only. If you're looking for amalgam toxicity and you're measuring the hair, you are way out of luck because you're not looking at what's coming from amalgam at all. Urine is almost all inorganic mercury. A little bit of methyl, but it's almost all inorganic mercury until you take the chelators. So stool then is both methylmercury and inorganic mercury. And then what's in the provoked urine? You have both methylmercury and inorganic. Again, ambient urine is just inorganic. Provoked urine, both methyl and inorganic are coming through in the urine. So challenge tests. So uh, when I said heretical content, uh, I didn't even talk about the biggest heresy that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to proceed now to poo-poo challenge tests and tell you that you do not need to use them. Uh, and the people who tell you you do need to use them are my competitors. So take that for what it's worth. But if you go back to the data that was originally generated trying to see whether challenge tests actually show body burden the way people think that they do. 
you'll find that they don't really do that. So what do they mean and are they necessary? So, uh, I'm sorry, this paper is uh, from Margareta Molan in Sweden. Sweden had a lot of the early research on mercury because they're genetically more sensitive to mercury and thus they banned mercury first, banned amalgam first. And so mobilized mercury in subjects with varying exposure to elemental mercury elemental mercury vapor. And so what they got here is a, a variety of different people. Uh, and here in this first one, we're comparing urinary mercury content, just ambient urinary mercury content, to plasma mercury content. So the first group, all the way up at the top, are mercury industrial workers. They're chloralkali facility workers. They basically have a pool of liquid mercury that they do uh, a reaction on salt in. The second most exposed group are the dentists. Then there's people with amalgams, and then people without amalgams. And you go from lowest to highest, from the least exposure to the most exposure. And there's a nice linear correlation between urinary mercury and plasma mercury. Plasma is the blood without the red blood cells. And they use plasma because most of the methyl mercury is on the red blood cells. So this was a cheap way to do a little bit of speciation. All right, now we're looking at, looks like the same graph. This is 24-hour provoked DMPS urine versus plasma mercury. Now, the idea here was that the dentist had 30 years of exposure and the industrial workers had three or four years of exposure. So buried in the tissues should be more mercury in the dentists. And when you provoke them, they should rise up to the level of the industrial workers or go beyond it. But indeed, you have exactly the same spread. Industrial workers, dentists, amalgam, and amalgam free. And this linear run between what came out in the urine with the DMPS and what was in the plasma beforehand. It's linear. It's not coming out of some mythical place. And the urinary output 24 hours with the DMPS is also linearly correlated with the urinary output before the DMPS. What this really means is that the DMPS is just draining what was in the blood. And so they went on in, uh, in, in, in their discussion to say the mercury excretion provoked by DMPS intake was well associated with the pre-DMPS mercury levels in plasma and urine. Our hypothesis that body burden and thus the long-term exposure would be reflected by the DMPS mobilization test. However, this hypothesis was not supported by our data. It was draining the blood. Uh, this is just a look at lead DMSA. This is, uh, this is blood lead levels. And then they take DMSA, and the blood goes down, 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 down. And then you stop taking DMSA, and the blood comes up, 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 as the cells start to release material back into the blood. So just going in and draining the blood once, you have a very big store in your, in your cells. Uh, the DMSA is draining the blood. So, we, all right, one, we know that it's not taking it from these hidden stores showing body burden. So we know it's draining the blood. Number two, we know there's a lot more in your cells than there is in your blood. And it's going to be a long-term process of draining the body. Okay, mercury speciation testing separates the two main forms of mercury in the human body. Once separately measured, ambient measurements reveal a lot without challenge tests. So we're going to separate methyl and inorganic mercury and look at them individually. Then when we have reference levels, we can have reference levels individually for the different forms. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about methyl mercury. Uh, usually we talk about inorganic mercury in relation to amalgams, but methyl mercury is a big deal too. Uh, the direct toxicity is not as high as inorganic mercury. It's got one binding site to monkey with proteins instead of two. But it has these insidious properties. It's very slow to excrete. It's got an almost perfect enterohepatic circulation, meaning you kick it out in your bio, but you reabsorb it then later on. Uh, it's a constant source of inorganic mercury from breakdown of methylmercury. So if you have become hypersensitive to inorganic mercury due to your amalgams and formed an allergy, like Vera Steschkel talks about, if you get rid of your amalgams, but you don't get rid of the methylmercury, the methylmercury is a constant source of more inorganic mercury to maintain your hypersensitivity. It has the all-access pass. It goes across the intracellular membranes, blood barrier membranes, placental barriers, so it can get everywhere and do its work. And it can, it can form its own allergy. 
Vera told me that 10% of her amalgam-related allergies were methylmercury allergies, not inorganic mercury allergies. And Ann Summers told us how methylmercury could be synthesized from the amalgam-derived mercury in our gut. So some of the amalgam toxicity can be methylmercury amalgam toxicity. And if the phase two enzymes are weak, it's very difficult to get rid of methylmercury. Again, this is just a uh, diagram of the enterohepatic circulation. If we're lucky, we'll get past that quickly. So blood testing. The old dictum on blood testing was that blood testing was only three days. Oh, blood's just a recent exposure, just what you just had. That's not really true. There is a three-day peak after you eat a swordfish, and it goes up quick, and then it comes down, and then there's a much slower, slower decay that is indicative of your body burden at that point. So the real problem uh, was that most labs at the time didn't have speciation and they didn't have the sensitivity to see low level dynamics. And that's part of the reason that I think challenge tests were, were, were in vogue because it was much easier. Your levels, your ambient levels went, it, you know, you went from ambient levels to a very high level that's very easy to read with equipment. Uh, just to show you a little bit about this very quick spike, this was a technician of mine eating two cans of tuna. This is him before tuna uh, at uh, 0.37. Two hours later, he's up to one part per billion, and 24 hours later, he's up to almost two and a half. And then, a couple of, I mean, so it's like, boom, it really comes up. And we actually missed the peak, which is up here, it's around 12 hours. And then it comes down after that. Now, it used to be that the uh, equipment they used to use when they first started working with mercury had a detection limit like this. So when this is the dynamics of the situation, they didn't see any of this. So they said, oh, look, there's mercury there for three days, and then it's gone. There's no more mercury. So as long as you can see the dynamics, uh, you will see something good. So a little bit more uh, about the residence time. This was done in the 80s, actually. And this is someone, he had, he had his graduate students eating walleye that was like nine parts per million, uh, which was kind of sadistic. But you see this, this is in hours. There's a very big peak around 12 hours. And then everything starts to come back down. Within 60 hours, you come down to a new level. And if we look at the long term, uh, decay, there's 160 days after you take in that bolus dose until you're all the way back down to where you were before. That's a lot more than two to three days. And then if you're repeatedly eating, you're going to stay up at a level up here. Uh, now we're going to talk about the analysis. Just kidding. That is the schematic of how we do mercury speciation analysis. It's a pretty complex uh, machine. But to see it come out, we, we, uh, this is uh, measuring a signal of mercury. And first, you get a methylmercury peak. Then you get an inorganic mercury peak. This is one person's sample. The next person, this person has way, 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 way more methylmercury. Uh, and inorganic than the first person. This person doesn't eat any fish, and they had their amalgams out about five to seven years before this was taken, but they have a terrible genetic profile for detoxification and runaway inflammation, and uh, had a heart attack, a valve replacement. There was a number of different issues. Uh, so looking at an ambient measurement suite, what I'm calling this is compartment ratio testing. So how can we take ambient measures and relate them to one another to see what's going on in the body. So again, blood is methylmercury and inorganic. Hair is methylmercury only. So we can relate the blood methylmercury to the hair methylmercury. Urine is only inorganic mercury. We can relate the excretion in the urine of inorganic mercury to the inorganic mercury in the blood. So let's just look at a couple examples of this. Uh, this is a, a, a dentist who maintains a very clean practice. She has uh, this gray here is the average of everybody. The top set of bars is methylmercury. The smaller set of bars is inorganic mercury. And then you, can, you add them together here for total. So she has a, a, a lower than average amount of methylmercury, roughly average amount of inorganic mercury. She takes amalgams out all the time. This is actually a very low level for someone who's taken amalgams out. Now we're going to look at some ratios. This is hair methylmercury versus blood methylmercury. There is a pretty well-established excretion line of 290 to 1 for hair to blood. And uh, you can look at these ratios. You think back to Boyd Haley's look at autistics. 
uh, who had high mercury exposure but low excretion in the hair. And we look at her uh, ratio. This is our line where we want to be. The red is where we don't want to be. She's looking good. She's on that line. Her urinary output of inorganic mercury versus her blood mercury. Again, there's an optimum excretion line. She's right on that. Everything's fine. Now, let's look at another dentist who's now in the 99th percentile of mercury levels. Uh, he has a massive inor uh, methyl mercury level. He has a massive inorganic mercury level. Uh, his blood to hair ratio is, is into the red, and his urine to blood ratio is way, way down. For the blood level he has, he should be putting out uh, seven parts per billion, and he's putting out about 0.1 or 0.2. His kidneys stopped working. Now, one of the things that this guy has is chronic inflammation, an inflammatory autoimmune disease where he has turned down all of his transport mechanisms and everything builds up and you can see it build up in the blood and you can see that it's not excreting by looking at the excretory pathways. Here's another dentist. He's got a, a reasonable methylmercury level but really high inorganic. So how does that look like in the excretion? His hair to blood ratio is pretty nice and he's, he's doing all right on methylmercury. But his kidneys, his kidneys are shot. He should be up here. And so it's building up in his blood. One more guy, uh, this guy, he was uh, at 20 parts per billion. It was super, super high. Blood to hair ratio is awful. His naturopath told him that meat was bad for him and he should eat tuna every day. He doesn't have the genes to do that. Uh, this is a little bit about hair. This is that ratio line, and, you, and this is, uh, this is the, the, the blood methylmercury. The, higher, the people with a higher blood methylmercury tend to have bad ratios. People with a lower blood methylmercury tend to have good ratios, meaning they can pump stuff out, whereas these guys can't. Uh, toxicity diagnosis is a totally different ballgame. I can tell you how much you have and how well you're getting rid of it, but can I tell you if you're hypersensitive to it? Can I tell you if you're missing a neuroprotective protein and, uh, and you have uh, neurotoxicity? No, I can't. Uh, so the toxic response from, comes from abilities of our defense systems, hypersensitivities or allergies, and they need to be diagnosed with a combination of clinical symptomology and some auxiliary testing. Auxiliary testing, Allergy testing, like uh, the MELISA or ELISA tests, can show you if you're hypersensitive. Uh, porphyrins show stress to the ATP cycle and to the kidneys. Glutathione levels, which I, I think are going to be a great way to go, will tell you how well you are dealing with everything or how well you can deal with everything. Glutathione has transferase activity, thyroidoxin, thyroidoxin reductase activity. I'm going to look into these in the next year and hopefully have some information on you. And then there's genetic testing. Are you lacking genes for glutathione synthesis or use of glutathione, APOE, CPOX? These are some of the auxiliary testing, tests. And so there is no one test that can tell you how much you have and how toxic you are. And I'm sorry to say that. Uh, so last thing, how are we going to get stuff out? Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, uh, about a, a product we have and about a whole range of natural compounds that turn on your body's ability to detoxify. Uh, and so notice I call it amplifying and augmenting natural systems. We don't necessarily have to go in and manhandle the mercury and force it out. Uh, so what are the requirements for your system to work? First, you need sufficient intracellular glutathione. Uh, liposomes are pretty good for that. IV doesn't get into the cells, though. It's kind of difficult. You need to turn it on from inside. And I'm going to talk about how plant extracts can do that. Effective GST activity. That's the phase two for the mobilization. You need that. And you need effective phase three transport out and then clearing. So once you get to the intestines, you need something to make sure that it gets all the way out. So now I'm going to flip that on its head and talk about a, a, a product and a couple of other uh, natural compounds for doing this. Uh, intestinal metal detox is a silica-based product that we made, which is kind of like OSR on a sand grain. Uh, it's got sulfide groups for binding metals, and it's, they're attached permanently to a little grain of sand that you take orally and moves through the intestine, binds up all the metals in the intestine, and uh, quenching the free radicals, moving the metals away from the transporters, and opening back up the transporters. Phytonutrients, then. 
Uh, the antioxidant response element is a very exciting thing. It's like a master switch for all the good genes and all the enzymes. And we want to look at how do we turn that on because it upregulates transcription of phase two uh, of formation of glutathione, superoxide dismutase. It's, it's the master switch for all things good. And you need a source of glutathione. Uh, we've looked at liposomals from Redisorb and Live On Labs, nutritional therapy like uh, precursors to glutathione, uh, and OSR has been shown to increase levels too. So uh, IMD, like I said, is, uh, it's, uh, it's a silica. It's insoluble, non-absorbed, that's saturated with the binding groups. It is funneling things through the intestines and not the kidneys. We've seen the kidneys are falling apart in chronically exposed people. Don't go there. Binds mercury and moves it out of the body from the intestines, interrupts the enterohepatic circulation, so you stop reabsorbing it, and seems to open up the phase three transporters. Uh, we see that in bilirubin levels, which are not related to sulfhydryls, and I'll show you data from that. And then it's relying on your natural detox system to work, and uh, that's where we bring in uh, where we bring in the phytonutrients. So this was our uh, inflamed, non-transporting state, and we want to get back to a normal state and let your body do what it was meant to do in the first place. Uh, I said that the, the silica product seems to open up the phase three transporters. Well, the glucuronidation pathway for bilirubin, uh, uh, you know, Hal Huggins was using this, and he has all these people with hyperbilirubinemia. And he found that giving them the silica drain their hyperbilirubinemia, even though the silica doesn't bind, uh, glucur it doesn't bind bilirubin at all. And so we are getting 45, 47%, 25% drops over the course of a week. So again, these conjugates all go out the same door. You've got to open up that door. Uh, just a quick look. Uh, this was a German study taking 25 people, uh, left their amalgams in, 25 people took their amalgams out and tracked their blood with speciation for a year and a half. Inorganic mercury, it's, it's hard to see all this, but inorganic mercury falls within 90 days and keeps falling on a slower limb over the next year and a half, predictably, because you move, you take out the amalgams. The inorganic mercury, where you leave the amalgams in, stays steady. The methylmercury, where you leave the amalgams in, it bounces around, but it stays steady. The methylmercury, where you pull the amalgams out, goes up. Why does it go up? So, looking at this model, again, no revision, no change in methylmercury. Revision, methylmercury goes up. All right, so now here is a slide of, uh, of me taking uh, IMD, this binding agent, for a year after Steve Coral took my amalgams out, and it's going down. That's methylmercury going down, and that's the inorganic mercury going down. Why does it go up? when you're not interrupting enterohepatic circulation because you take that inflammation source out of your gut and your transferases kick on, your glutathione kicks on, and you start mobilizing things out of your cells into your blood. But then with methylmercury, you're stuck with enterohepatic circulation. So you need something to help you drain. Uh, just a comparison, this was the walleye experiment, 46 to 66 days, half-life of methylmercury after eating fish. This is me after Charlotte, North Carolina. I ate some sea bass, my blood went up, you know, several fold, and then we can track me going down, and the half-life is now 17 days. All the way down to baseline was 160 without any treatment, it's 40 days now uh, with, with taking a bonding product. Uh, this was the guy who had uh, 20 parts per billion in his blood. I'm not going to show you a lot of case studies, but this is the one. We put him on, uh, Steve took his amalgams. He was on the IMD and the phytonutrient therapy and nutritional therapy, and he went from 20 down to 2 over the course of 5 to 6 months. And his inorganic mercury, which was uh, up around a part per billion, which is very high for inorganic mercury, is now undetectable. So. My favorite subject here is the phytonutrients and the upregulation of, uh, of your detox uh, enzymes. And this is uh, an area often called phytogenomics because it's, gene, it's plants turning on genes. And certain phytochemicals will upregulate phase two enzymes as well as production of your antioxidants, glutathione and superoxide dismutase. The only way to change your oxidative stress profile is by turning on your own antioxidants. You can take vitamin C, which is great for you, till you're blue in the face, and it won't change 
your oxidative damage inside. You have to turn it on from inside. So when you do turn it on from inside, it's called the anti-inflammatory cascade. And this is bringing up detoxification and house cleaning, which is antithetical to inflammation. Inflammation is for killing things with oxidative stress. Anti-inflammation is antioxidative stress, reductants, and house cleaning enzymes. So they're very different. The things that can turn these on, polyphenols, sulfur compounds like crucifers, crucifers and garlic. Back in the old days, people would say, oh, the sulfur compounds are chelating the mercury. They are not. They are turning on your own defense system at a genetic level. They're not chelators. Also, by the way, progesterone and pregnenolone do activate this same series of genes. So if that is warranted, it will help you. This is the crazy biochemical slide. Again, I'm a PhD. I've got to put stuff up here that makes you go, oh my god, what's that? Uh, so this is a protein called the NERF2, which is out in the cytoplasm. And it's held in place by the KEEP1 protein. And when the polyphenols or the sulfur compounds come in here, they tag that, and then this thing moves into the nucleus, and it finds the genes that have a promoter region that respond to it. And the genes, it's like a family of good genes. It's like I said before, glutathione synthesis, glutathione transferase synthesis, superoxide dismutase, the transport proteins, all of them come on at once. It's a big master switch for getting everything going. So I showed you this uh, movement from methylmercury toxification to death. How do you stop that? You stop that from decreasing exposure, take your amalgams out. Increasing glutathione synthesis and recycling, increasing glutathione enzyme activity, increasing thyroidoxin, and, uh, and then you put out all the fires. And again, these master switches can do that for you. So the polyphenols, again, the anti-inflammatory cascade, upregulating enzymes. They also have very strong vascular protective effects. Paranandi is going to talk about all the damage that can happen to your cells in your epithelium of your blood vessels when all this metal is moving through there. It's very crucial to protect that. They're also anti-cancer. They cross the blood-brain barrier. Oh, incidentally, the coolest part of this whole game, those transport proteins that are in your gut, they're at your blood-brain barrier. You turn them on together, you have the potential to drain the brain. Everybody says, how do we detoxify the brain? The machinery is there to do it. Turn it on. Uh, some of the polyphenols, we all know these. This is epicatechin in green tea extract, in cocoa, in pine bark extract, in grapeseed extract. This is elagic acid from pomegranates, from uh, raspberry leaves. This is quercetin from fruit skins. This is my favorite of all polyphenolics. It's called harataki. Uh, it's called the king of herbs in Tibet, Terminalia chebula. Uh, some, some great Ayurvedic physicians uh, went and actually tested this. For a while, everybody thought broccoli extract was the only thing that did all this. Why did they think that? Because guys from Johns Hopkins patented broccoli seed extract and then made a ton of data. So all the data is there. Oh, it's broccoli seed extract. Yeah, well, the guys, the Ayurvedic guys don't have all that equipment, so they never did this. And then finally, they got some equipment. They did the tests. Brilliantly, they took young rats and old rats and you see, just like everybody, your glutathione, your vitamin C, everything goes down with age. Your oxidative stress markers go up. They took young, young rats and old rats. They treated the old rats with harataki extract. And all the markers, you'll never be able to read any of this, but it's uh, manganese superoxide dismutase, catalase peroxidase, glutathione reductase, glutathionase transferase, glutathione, vitamin C, vitamin E. Everything went from a decayed state back to the young state. These numbers are virtually identical after you treated these old rats with polyphenols. So all you old rats get some harataki. Uh, the interesting thing there, uh, well, this doesn't really matter. That's too much. Uh, <laughs> sulfur compounds. Uh, so this was back into the broccoli and garlic family. They do all the same things, anti-carcinogenic, upregulate the enzymes, anti-inflammatory. These are the ones. This is sulforaphane. This is the 
the famous one from the broccoli family or the cabbage family. Uh, ideally, you will grind everything up when it's raw and then eat it, like juicing it. Uh, cooking it makes it a little bit harder to break down. So that's from the broccoli family. Arusin is from the broccoli family, just slightly different. It's these sulfurs that are going in and hitting that uh, transcription factor. This is allyl isothiocyanate, oil of horseradish. This is wasabi. All right, why do the Japanese, why are they able to eat so much damn tuna and be okay? All right, they eat wasabi on their tuna. They have allicin in their garlic. They have sulforaphane and arusin. All they eat are broccoli compounds. I mean, bok choy, pak choy. I mean, these are all the same things here. They got polyphenolics in their miso, and they drink a ton of green tea. And they protect their thyroid with all the iodine. So that's my Japan story tied into sulfur compounds. And then you need a source of glutathione. Last thing on the list, like I said, the liposomal glutathione is very interesting because just putting glutathione in your blood doesn't get it into your cells. But liposomes are a trick around that. And also, taking oral glutathione, it breaks down in the stomach and it doesn't get absorbed. Uh, so the trick around that is called a liposome, and it looks very much like a cell wall. It's a phospholipid bilayer. And so it's seen by your digestive system as a fat. And you don't do anything to fats to break them down, really. You just emulsify them. So this gets, you hide your glutathione inside this fat sphere, and it goes through the stomach into the small intestine, and then pops right into the lymph through and into the blood through the small intestine. And so it's a direct route in. Uh, and there's good evidence that they actually get into the cells. They've done macrophage oxidation tests in ApoE2 deficient mice that have arthrosclerosis, and they find that the oxidative, uh, the oxidative damage is quenched by the liposomes, where it's not usually quenched by just taking glutathione directly. Uh, nutritional augmentation, vitamin C, all of those antioxidant polyphenols and sulfur compounds I talked about, glutathione precursors like N-acetylcysteine, glutamate, lysine, N-acetylcysteine with vitamin C. Uh, I think uh, Russell Jaffe comes every couple of years and tells you about that. Uh, whey powder has a lot of the precursors to it, including one that's called GGC, which is gamma glutamyl cysteine, which is a direct precursor to uh, to glutathione, and certain people have a deficiency of the enzyme to take glutamate and cysteine and put them together into GGC. So GGC is just in development from Australia, and it will be one of the ways that you upregulate your glutathione production. So in summary, retention toxicity, I mean, this is how Hal Huggins used to talk about it. That's when you're not getting this stuff out. Now we can look at retention toxicity. We can see it. It's related to a dysfunction of the natural glutathione detox system, but it affects other detox systems because it's turning down the whole uh, detox system all at once, even things that aren't related to glutathione. Inflammation is a major impediment to detoxification. If you need to clean yourself up, you have to get rid of inflammation any way you can. Methylmercury is a hidden danger with amalgam. I didn't mention it. Uh, uh, Ann Summers had talked about synthesis of methylmercury in the gut from amalgam-derived mercury. And I've looked at vegetarians who don't eat fish who have high methylmercury levels in their blood. It's all a flora, it's all a flora thing. They have amalgam. They're synthesizing it because they have the right bacteria for it. Mercury speciation testing and compartment ratio analysis to monitor the detox and to tell you what your, uh, you know, uh, estimate your body burden without taking a gram and a half of DMSA on broken kidneys. And opening up the channels and upregulating, uh, opening up channels and upregulating the natural detox system as a safe and effective detox strategy. So that's everything I have to say. Three hours and one.